hit and record and welcome again. Let's get started. Hi everybody, good afternoon. I hope most of you watch the videos because I think the videos are wonderful and they give you a background uh, that I don't have to talk about today. Otherwise we would be talking the whole time about the artists instead of looking at their art. But I did ask you um, if you wanted to have lunch with one of the artists, who would that be? And I didn't hear from very many of you. Um, and I think maybe the reason that I didn't hear from you uh, is because you couldn't decide which of the artists would make, um, <clears throat> be most interesting. But the people I did hear from both thought that Louise Nevelson would be, would be the one. And she certainly seems charming and lovely. I do have to tell you that when I thought of the idea, um, the one person that I really hesitated for myself, the one that I didn't think I wanted to have lunch with in the end is the one that I would. And that's Helen Frankenthaler, who was a very complex person, not that the others aren't. But um, she, in many ways, her whole history and background is, is particularly interesting. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. I've decided that we'll look at the artists in chronological order. So we're going to start with Louise Nevelson. And just again, to remind you of her background, she was born in Russia and then um, came to Maine. Um, her parents moved to Maine when she was a small child. She never really felt comfortable or part of the environment. But by the time she was um, maybe nine or 10, she knew not only that she wanted to be an artist, but she knew she wanted to be a sculptor. And I think that's particularly interesting because she doesn't see by color. That's although she's done some prints that have a nice use of color, but she really doesn't see by color. And um, so the idea of going into sculpture uh, seems quite natural. Um, let's start by looking at this one um, image. I think probably most of you are familiar with Louise Nevelson and particularly the black boxes that, that she created. I loved the video about New York um, as part of her art, not only finding the different um, pieces that she worked from, the different materials and the alleys and whatnot, but uh, just the whole spirit of the city was so much part of her vision. And yet the idea of working with wood is also intriguing because she, her father did own a lumber yard. So she's going back in a sense and, and bringing um, the wood into her artistic vocabulary. When you look at this piece, Notice um, first, just the numbers of sections. There are little, very small little windows, but what stands out? Do you first see a bunch of little windows or bigger shapes? What stands out? I, for me, the standing out is the curves in the second and third line because they're different. The curves really pull your eye and look at the placement of the two larger, the sort of larger curves, because they tend to go off if you were to complete it. Well, if you were to complete that big oval, and I wish that I could point, but I hope everybody sees the biggest oval. Um, where, where, how can I put this? Notice how it's placed. How is that big oval placed on the large shape? Well, it's off center. It's off center and it's basically kissing. If you were to complete the top edge of it, you'd see it um, just kissing the edge, the left side. And that sets up uh, a very nice tension in the shape. But what keeps us from getting locked 
in that position? Where does the eye go from there? To the corner of that, of that square. The corner, is it Gail who's speaking? Yes, yes. Um, the corner of which scale? Okay, so I'm looking at the cutout of the square, the second row down, the second on the left. So mm. you're so you're looking at the shape, which looks like a geometric shape, and then the other part of the square is not um, is solid. Okay. Are you looking at the bottom left? Um, no, I'm looking at the top right. Okay. So your eye moved up to the top right. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's interesting when you're looking at a piece like this, whether you kind of move to the opposite. There's a nice tension, Gail. Maybe that's part of what drew, drew your eye up to the top right, because those two corners that are kind of um, opposites are, t are connected at the corner, and that sets up another tension. And the more that you look at the piece, the more tensions you'll find. I just noticed something. Um, because we were talking before about how the oval pulls our eye over to the left, but if you were to complete, um, if you were to take the right side of that oval and complete it so it makes a circle, because in a way your mind can do that too, then that moves it back to, um, towards the center. And it's, it's a very subtle thing. Um, notice the way the artist uses shadow or how shadow gets created um, from this work because light and shadow are so, are so important to what you're looking at. Let's have the next slide. So how is this immediately different from the last one? The color. Besides the color. And I don't know if this is really supposed to be black or if it's a gray. And that's the problem with seeing images uh, on the internet. But what else is different about this? Different shapes of the windows. Different shapes. And particularly if you remember the last one as a box, as a, as a, a rectangle, look at what she's done with this, with this piece. How does that um, broken rectangle, the ones that are, that don't complete one uh, rectangle, how does that affect what you're seeing? What some of them, some of them recede on the back, on the left side, and some in the middle come forward. Some of them seem to go back and, and forth, particularly that one on the left side. What else? I know Jackie had her hand up. And I don't know if you can see me. I don't know how to do this. Am I, are we supposed to raise our hand or what are we supposed to do here? Just Karen? say, Jackie, just respond. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know how you do this. Okay. Well, the first one, it's interesting how you divided it up into boxes. I thought the first one, I looked at the whole unit. I didn't divide it. I thought it was interesting that you did, but I didn't. I looked at it as a cubist, cubist type of picture. This one, since I designed miniature houses, it reminds me of several miniature rooms on top of each other. And, uh, and so I looked at it differently because it looked like a combination of different rooms together. Oh, well, that's interesting. So you look into the parts, whereas right. the other one you see I as a whole. The whole unit. I but there's, an, there's another thing happening here, which is if you just go around the outside of the shape, um, look at the different movement that gets created going around rather than having an image that's contained. And part of what Jackie was saying, I think, is seeing it as a whole, the last one, and feeling that it's more contained. And this one um, keeps shifting around. How has the artist, find some ways in which the artist has connected the images from one section uh, to another? Let's. There's arches. There's like the, uh, there's shapes that are curved that seem to move your eye around and they connect the 
connect the pieces together, the boxes. And they connect it right through, which is really interesting. If you look at the left side, mm -hmm. um, not the far Didn't left, but the next one, there's a big curve that runs through a couple of, a couple of the boxes. And then each box, if you were to live with a piece like this, each box would tell its own, its own little story. You could get uh, lost in, in each one. Um, I think it's really interesting that the artist painted all of these um, in one color because there's so much going on that if there were a lot of colors, and I said before, she said she didn't, she didn't say she didn't see by color. I'm saying she didn't. Um, it would get to be too uh, confusing. Annie, can we have the next slide? It's interesting to me a little bit too, how, um, especially when Jackie said it's like the rooms and the houses that she builds, you know, she was influenced by the city so much. And it's almost like when you look at a building that you're taking, mm -hmm. what's the different view that could be happening inside those, those squares or rectangles um, that you see all around you. It's like another little world. And that's interesting with that other little world, are you viewing into windows and in a city or are you looking down um, because your perspective could also be an aerial perspective. How is this one different from the last one? It's more intense. I feel like I'm looking down at something rather than looking, I feel like I'm looking down. It seems like the material is different. The others did look like wood. This is like uh, maybe um, something else. It's all wood. But it's, this could be maybe but iron or look metal. At the, look at the edge of this, the border. I'm gonna call it the, the border that goes around the whole piece. And what happens at that border that's different from the last one? Continuous. It's continuous. The edges feel sharper. The edges feel sharper. And if you remember, and, and part of it is it's, there's even more movement around, but if you remember the last one, I don't know if we can go back. Is that too hard, Annie? So look at the edge here. And now let's shift back to the, the next one. So you see what she's basically done here? Is she's in a way created a frame. Right. That whole edge is flatter. It's flatter around the outside, the, whereas basically the other one ended with the boxes. How does that affect what you're seeing? What does that do for the piece? I think it makes it look more like a whole piece rather than individual pieces put together. It unites it. It does. It puts it in a, in a frame and unites it. Actually, you look at the frame more than the inside. You actually look at the outside before you look at the inside. Do you think this looks more like metal than wood? Yeah. That's interesting, though. What, what I, Jackie said was that it makes you look um, at the outside before the inside. You see the whole shape. Whereas in the last one, you were seeing pieces of shapes. I, um, yeah, Carol? I wonder if she did this more recently, this piece. To me, it looks like the inside of a mechanical thing, which is kind of interesting since it's made of wood, I presume. I don't know. But uh, it looks like, you know, the inside of a computer or something that you don't know about. And probably earlier than computers, um, she died in, I should remember, she was born in something like 99 and died in 88, I think. So it would really be more than that. Computer. I, I feel sorry. No. I have to apologize because when I found these slides, I did have dates for them. But then um, I forgot to write the, the dates here. So I don't remember. But I think this is one that I, I'm not quite sure. She, she went back and forth. Look Excuse at me, the, Karen has a question, Joanna? Oh, actually it was a comment. Comment? You can still hear me. Yes. Uh, this particular piece, I do feel that it has the smoothness of metal. 
and the white and the wide frame i feel it makes it even though it is busy and it has many parts i now think there's a lot of repetition of the parts but it doesn't seem quite as chaotic maybe it's the color maybe it's the appearance of the material and i think the um wideness the thickness or well, the wideness i guess the thickness well wide of the frame it just kind of brings me in i'm more focused i feel it's like definitely it, it feels definitely more organized and speaking of the don't you think it looks more modern i don't know what that means more i mean more like today i feel it's more I more can relate contemporary to this. yes more contemporary um i don't know i really don't um because so many things are going on, but I can see it certainly feels more stylized. That's what I mean, others. more stylized. Um, and it's know. cleaner. It's, it feels so you don't feel the rawness of the streets as much, but maybe I'm um, thinking of the city in another way. And somebody had said computer earlier. What gives it the sense of a computer? <clears throat> different parts, all the different parts. What particular, um, so there are again different parts. Look at the shapes. In the middle. Look at the, the shapes in the middle. The, the cylinders. Right, the cylinders give it that look. It the like the cylinders are something, um, and part of what is really different in this one, and part of the organization, is how everything is lined up vertically and horizontally. The others had the curves that ran across. But look at the cylinders uh, and then see where they're repeated from another angle. Does that make sense? Well, they're vertical it's awesome. it's sort of in the upper right hand corner. corner. It looked like well, they're turned around and they look like the they're 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna help with this one. Let's do um Carol Cohen, Freda, I know Sharon had her a comment and then I'll look through. Well, on the left, the, the little cylinders are, are horizontal, but there's the, the over on the left, the, it looks like the end of cylinders, almost like batteries. Or like something. batteries. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. she switched them around, it looks like. Freda, did you have something different to say? The row of little circles on the, bot, on the bottom look like cylinders that could be that you could be looking down on on the tops of exactly anybody so, let's see i'm looking through from the beginning i thought it was a rooftop mm -hmm. i look i saw it as a bird's eye view looking from up from the, from looking down at something so that could be like the roof to me it looked like the roof of a of a of a, of a apartment building looks like the mechanicals right <laughs> of, of a high rise yes. did um did Sharon have a comment? Oh, no, my comment isn't uniquely different, but the cylinders definitely caught my eye. And she positioned them in the upper right-hand corner, the box, vertically. So I thought that was interesting, vertically, horizontally, and then some views are, as Carol said, up the top. So... Um, I feel movement with the cylinders. That's right. It's, a, it's a very... It is definitely a different kind of movement. Let's see the next slide. Well, I have a question. Too. Oh, Alexander, yes. the question. Sure. On the previous one, the previous one. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, no, the <laughs> next one, the black one. Yeah, it seems to me that the lower part of this piece is really technologically inspired and, and the, upper, the upper rectangle is really very artistic right. conception. And uh, I, also, I also was struck by the tendency to symmetry. If you look at the frame, the upper part is but Absolutely. almost reproduced on the bottom and same thing is true for the lateral part of the frame not quite but a tendency to so anyway 
<clears throat> That's a really um, interesting observation, Alexandra, that I didn't see initially was that sort of off symmetry. Um, and now I'm reading a whole square that then the other shapes from behind start moving. These works are just, they're, they're amazing. They get more interesting the longer, well, any good work gets more interesting the longer you look at it. Um, okay, shall we go on to the next one? Mm -hmm. I just, I'm going to, I just wanted to show you this one because there's little in it compared to, to the others. It, it's simpler and you also can recognize, um, recognize what, a bed frame? A, I'm not even sure. I say you can recognize it, but then there are different possibilities. Um, so I just really wanted to show you uh, her vocabulary um, that, just how, how great it is. Let's look at the next one. Okay, so now we have white. What does this thing remind you of? Paper, cut paper. Cut paper, yes. Exactly. Okay, and of course, if you saw it, um, you'd see again that it's wood. Anything in nature? A forest. Okay, um, I forgot to write the titles down for some of these, but this one I think had to do, as I recall, with rain, which I yes. thought was, you, you can get a feeling of that, uh, so it's a bit different. How does the white, how, how do you react to the white after the black? Any different emotion that comes as a result? I think it's more so fragile. It feels fragile. It's a lot softer. less intense. Yeah, softer. I, I, see, I see more texture. And part of the texture, I think, comes from the complexity. And there's always the question of how a picture is taken. But in this one, the shadows get to be really dark. Um, when you said paper earlier, I think that goes along with the sense of fragility, at least seeing it. Um, from this position. What I forgot to mention um, earlier is scale. Scale in the work that we're looking at today is really important, and this is quite large. Uh, most of them are, are quite big, and so you have to visualize that maybe this would be the size of a door, a doorway. It, lo it looks to me like it's hard to put in a linear space up and down how the I don't know how the figures go in it, but she put them all in. They're really like close together. A lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of stuff going vertically and it's no like free space. What Sharon, organizes it besides the verticals? What other... Um, the boxes. The boxes. Now this isn't broken into boxes like the ones we saw previously not quite in the same way. So it's different because you've got uh, another kind of movement going through. And yet there is sort of a staircase. I could see climbing um, on a wall in a way that there are little platforms that you to can me, stop at. To um, me, this looks very complex. It does. And just again, because there are so very many different parts to it. Um, Carol has her hand up. It holds your interest because there's so many different shapes. Um, it like plays with you, you know, and mm -hmm. it draws you in to kind of figure it out or figure out what's there. So um, you don't get the sense of getting it maybe all at once, although we know we didn't get the last ones all at once either. Uh -huh. um, let's take a look at the next one. So now you have to realize that this, how big this is. This isn't a little tabletop sculpture, but it's probably larger than, than human size. And um, I know Marcia is with us today, and I'm thinking of the Louise Nevelson in the concert hall in uh, Naples, Florida. Right. And also um, 
<laughs> sorry, I'm blanking for a minute. It's but John anyway, John's forest. Uh, she did it's an incredible, and they're uh, they're all white. These sculptures that go around the the concert hall. Anyway, what does this look like? How do you identify what you're seeing, even though it's all abstract? Tall buildings. I see people. I see, I see people, people too. How many of you saw figures, sort of totemic figures? Yeah. Yes. Because I know that's the first thing that I that I thought of, and um, so. Again, now, this isn't in a box. It's more open in space. So the negative space becomes uh, important, the places that, that you see through. What kind of activity? What does it feel like in terms of um, motion? To me, it looks like a military parade. <laughs> a military parade. Okay. Marsha has her hand up. So I, I was so struck by her passion for New York, for the kind of the noise and the crowd and the, and the intensity and how she created a vocabulary of shape to kind of respond to that environment, which really seemed to inspire her for the majority Absolutely. of her career. And so, you know, I kind of hear New York and hear that the noise and the crowding and the energy, this is a great deal of energy. There's almost a sense of, of dynamism to the piece. And it all goes back, her interviews were so compelling because she's so dead on in what inspires her, what has motivated her, what has been in her consciousness from start to finish. And it's remarkable. Absolutely, and all I can say is these people have no social distancing. Right. <laughs> but, um, the fact that it's white also creates, and I really like that image of a crowd um, and, and maybe um, moving in different directions. If you're on the streets of New York and you don't know whether to move to the right or the left sometimes because of the crowd. But the, and she's not literally doing that, at least I don't think, but we still read it. Um, how does the white, what if this were black, and she's done black ones like this, what does the white do? White shows the curves, and it makes the people, if we, if we think they are people, look different. They're all different, like the people in New York. They're all, it's a variety of different people, and that's what I see here. I see crowded, crowded streets with different kind of people in them by using shape. Okay, and true, but why white? What if it were black? Think of the, the difference. How does white, what does white do? Yeah. It makes it more alive. I was going to say that I feel uh, the layers more so with the white. White feels a little more delicate to me. I said that before, a little soft. And I'm very aware of the layers that she used. And you can see the shadow, shadows. It also makes it, it definitely makes it lighter. So otherwise it would be a heavy, heavier crowd. And it, this way you, you do feel the movement, which um, some of you said. I neglected, I had one slide that didn't work, but I'm gonna mention the piece anyway. And it's called White, it's called Dawn. Most of these are called Dawn at something or other. Um, she did a, a church in, in New York City that also has this white and this kind of spiritual feeling that she also got in, um, was able to create in, in, her later, in her later years. But the Art Institute owns a wonderful piece and I can't remember when I last saw it because it takes up so much space. Of course, it's not on view very um, frequently, but hopefully it will be. And it's another one of these white um, big white sculptures that you could feel. It's almost like a room that you could enter. Um, let's have the next slide. And I'll just go through this quickly. Gold. She worked in gold. And again, this one, um, you can just see that it's a, a huge piece and to really appreciate it, 
you'd have to um, almost be in the middle of it. What, what does this look like? What does it feel like? An altarpiece. Sure. An altarpiece, yeah. and I think that's, it looks like a Torah, the open, the, the door is opening up to a Torah, and I, and, and you, like, I could see her opening it up, it looks very, like a synagogue inside. Could it be the inside of a temple? Looks like, it looks um, like, I think like a chapel. Looks like the inside of a chapel, a temple. A temple, a chapel. I thought it was a bank vault. <laughs> so, I missed that. Bank vault. Um, so again, she was able to get this feeling. The gold just adds to it. The shapes, um, the shapes do as well in the sense that it can open. Let's look at the last one, or it's not the last one, um, the, of Louise, of Nevelson. So this is a smaller piece. And again, here it's simple, but she also colored this one in gold. What's besides the rectangles? What shapes seem to dominate? Mm -hmm. Circles. 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 Yeah. Circle. Circle. Those big circles. Then there are smaller circles, and the more you look. And what about the triangles? And triangles, right? And the triangles. So it seems a little bit more ordered, flattened out than some of the other ones. I love that you can recognize different parts in her work. Uh, that might fit into furniture or be part of a banister. Um, getting back again to uh, her background or her father's. Um, she was married, um, Louise Nevelson married uh, appropriately for her family, a well-to-do Jewish, um, I think he was a sh came from a shipbuilding family actually when she was quite young. And then she, she had one son who became a sculptor. And I just learned that today and I didn't get a chance to look him up, um, Mike um, Nevelson. And uh, as you could tell probably from some of the videos, motherhood was not her thing. Um, and she left her husband after 11 years and her career didn't develop that quickly. She um, went to the, after she was married, she went to the Art Students League in New York, and it took her uh, quite a while. I think she had her first show, single show in her 40s. But then, of course, she was very successful um, after that. She was in a Venice Biennial, um, the 31st Venice uh, Biennale. Let's take a look at the next slide of hers. And I wanted to point out, this is from Storm King, the big sculpture, uh, <clears throat> the, the sculpture garden in New York, up in New York State, was that there. was David Smith's home originally. And we're not going to discuss it, but I just really wanted you to see how vast her vocabulary was and how able she was to leave the actual shapes that she had worked with previously in order to create this. And finally, Annie, can you put on the last of her slides? Joanna, what, what, uh, ho whose home was that, did you say? The sculptor David Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we went there when we were in. It was, it was um, <clears throat> turned into a big um, sculpture, sculpture garden. It's wonderful. Really nice. um, anyway, again, I'm not going to get into this one. This one was actually fairly late. I thought it might be early, but it shows her experimentation working a little differently. So let's go on to um, <clears throat> Helen Frankenthaler. Before you do that, Joanna. Yes, Alexandra. Is it known how long it took her to do one of these elaborate pieces? I have not a clue. My guess is, of course, as she got older and she was so successful that she had assistants working with her. But I don't know. That's a question people always want to know. And, you know, some a piece like this, which maybe doesn't feel like it took as long, may have taken her even longer because till she decided mm. uh, exactly how to put it together. 
So let's move on to um, Helen Frankenthaler. And this is one of her great famous pieces. It's huge. Mountains and Sea. F Mountains and Sea. Frankenthaler, you got to think scale. And I hope that you watch the videos because then you got a sense of scale. Anybody have a reaction to the videos of Frankenthaler before we start looking at her work? I just, I, lo I loved her confidence about her technique, her relationship with paint, her scale, her, her explanation of how line is created was extraordinary. I've never heard an artist talk quite like that about how shape creates, the, the, the shape becomes the line. That, that you, you have to stop looking for it in the traditional way. So, I thought and that. Also, and also, you. Um, she talking about the show as a work of art in and of itself, that everything had to be hung a certain way uh, to make a work of art. And, and, and also, that's, that's really true. Uh, how art is displayed becomes more and more important to uh, different artists. Some artists aren't very good at putting their own work together and some are good. Um, I wondered if anybody found the piece, the, the line into color and color into line a little confusing. Did it make sense? Yes. Yeah. And he also said that color was the most important thing because when you put two colors together, it does create the line. And that's really important. I thought that when she talks, and particularly in the um, <clears throat> in the television one, sometimes she's so contradictory that she doesn't make sense at all. I would think to a normal person that she can seem very inarticulate, even though it was clear that you guys are terrific and you manage to see that colors coming together form a boundary and that a line is really a direction and not necessarily uh, a pencil or a um, other, other kind of line. But be, she talks a lot about ambiguity and that's part of what makes it um, a little complicated, but that's really what the art is about, that it isn't one thing, that it can be many things. And yet when she talks, sometimes it just, um, it's all of everything and, and nothing of anything. Um, she doesn't say those words exactly, but it can sound like that. Um, anyway, I, I found it very interesting. So this is one of her um, signature paintings, or one that was part of maybe making a, a transition. It's in the, um, <clears throat> the National Gallery in, in Washington. Huge, huge mountains and sea. Um, does it look, if you didn't know the title, and that's not quite fair, but if you didn't know the title, would you see mountains or what else would you see besides mountains and sea? Sailboat. I, I, I was going to, I see a sailboat. So that really brings the sea in. Birds. Uh -huh. I see birds. And birds. And flowers. 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 The color, the sand, sand color. The blue on the right actually looks almost like sea because that's the um, one, well, I was gonna say the only horizontal, but I'm looking and there's sort of a horizontal that runs all the way through if you look at some of the sand color. Um, what kind of activity does it have? Where is the activity the most congested? In the middle. Yeah, the middle. The exactly middle. the middle? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Up on top, on, on top of the middle, actually. And yeah. it looks like wind. Yeah. It like feels like wind. Seems um, like a lot of movement for a mountain range. <laughs> <laughs> Her eye kept moving. Um, and look at where the shapes, <clears throat> how they change in terms of size, where they're the smallest. If you look over at the kind of green area, 
towards the water and, and then down. It's, it's much more, um, the shapes are, are dense there. And then as you move to the left, they're open and to the right, uh, mm -hmm. they're open. How does she define a shape? What outline. does she do to tell you it's a sailboat? Outline. Okay, so outline is really important. Now take a look at where line doesn't become outline. I mean, where line doesn't really complete a shape. And how, and take a look at where the color itself uh, creates a shape. I'm gonna say a sandy beach in the middle. Because part of what she's doing that was really important is this line becomes color and color becomes line. Um, line creates one kind of activity and can make a form. You can almost see a bird at the upper, the just slightly off to the right of the middle where there's a line that goes around. Um, but the colors in it don't really have to do with the line. They create another shape that then goes through it. Am I making sense? Which color? Green. So um, look at the whole green area. And this is so hard because I would love to point and I can't point to the green. That looks to me like um, And there is a line that makes sort of a triangle and yeah. comes around. Looks like and there are a bunch of dots above it that go right through it. The green goes down again through it to the bottom and then sort of becomes sailboats as other line comes in. And the point that I really want to make here, because this looks like, oh, maybe it's easy to do, but it's really not at all easy to do. Um, there's an artist named Ashel Gorky who had come over to America, um, I guess I'm probably in the 30s, but he was painting in the 30s. And he started, he was one of the first to use this abstract expressionist vocabulary of creating shapes from line and other shapes from color. And I know that she was partly um, inspired uh, by him. And um, so let's take a look. Another thing before we leave this that's really important is that we can't see. But next time you can get out and go to a museum and see a real Frankenthaler, you need to look closely at the canvas because she did this idea of staining the canvas. And that is, this one was done in oil and with a lot of turpentine, which means that ultimately the canvas may, um, may not last. Um, but she sunk, instead of gessoing the canvas first, uh, <clears throat> instead of gessoing it so you have a hard surface, she left the soft surface and the paint seeps through and it creates a very different sense of the, um, the surface of the material, it goes through. Uh, then acrylic paints come along at this time too and then she switched over to acrylics and she ultimately helped influence a whole school of painters called the Washington School. Let's see the next slide. So I, I really wanted to point that out because I think this particular painting, also you have to think scale really big, that if you look closely, you'll see an edge, a little edge around the shapes like oil had seeped through. Um, I think it was created with a material called magna, which uh, was a kind of paint that could be worked with acrylics and it could be worked with oils. You can't mix oil and acrylic. But um, at this time, and that creates this little edge around the, the paint. Um, so... so Yes. I was going to ask early on, wasn't Helen greatly influenced by Jackson Pollock? Yes, I'm going to get to that. Um, let's get on to the next slide. So, right on time with Jackson Pollock. Um, she, she certainly was inspired by Pollock, and she was very young 
um, she had gone to, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of her background. Um, her father was a state Supreme Court judge in New York City. She came from a very um, uh, well-to-do German Jewish family in New York. Uh, she had two older sisters and she was very close to her father and always felt um, a little bit uh, different. She talks, there's a story I guess that she told about herself when she was a child, uh, a young child and taken to Central Park uh, by her uh, nanny. And I guess the nanny had brought some chalks and she decided, Helen decided that she was gonna draw a line from um, where they were near the Metropolitan Museum all the way home about 12 blocks away. And so she did, uh, apparently this is one of her early memories and she said mostly because of her obstinance in order to do it, not that she felt she was making a great piece of art. But anyway, uh, her father dies when she's uh, 11 years old and um, a very traumatic period for her. Uh, then, and at that time it's during the war and her mother is, or a few, few years later is during the war and her mother is trying to get relatives out of Germany, some cousins, and I think does not succeed in, in doing that. Um, she sent to a private school, a very um, uh, pro uh, prominent school, I guess, in New York City, where there are very few Jews. And of the Jews who are there, she's sort of a poorer one because they're all, um, I guess, uh, <clears throat> financially even, even better off. She fails and she's kept back. Uh, it said that she was probably distracted, had some, um, uh, what do you call those little things that you see in the eye, floaters, mm -hmm. something like that, or she thought she was getting them and she was looking out of the corners of her eyes. And anyway, so she flunk, she's held back, she fails again. And the question was, where was her mother during this time? And the person who wrote this suggested that her mother was worried about the family in Europe. Anyway, she um, transfers then to the Dalton School, which is a very good school in New York. And there um, she blossoms. Uh, she has a Rufino Tamayo, a very famous Mexican artist, is teaching there. And he thinks she's really good. And she, so she gets very excited about that. She goes on to Bennington um, College. And at that time, Bennington was really terrific in both the areas of visual art and literature. And she's torn between writing and art, uh, which I find interesting because I read something that she wrote that was at 18. It was a review for a show and it was so clear and direct, so unlike the way she speaks in the videos that I was really impressed. Anyway, she does um, uh, obviously uh, get into art. She gets to New York at a, I mean, she goes back to New York and um, that's when at some point she meets the critic, very important critic, Clement Greenberg. And they have an affair for about five years. He's in his 40s, she's 25 years younger than he. Um, and people have said that Clement Greenberg got her to do this work, not true, not true at all. Um, but obviously she was going in very uh, interesting art circles. She meets uh, <clears throat> Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock and, and sees Pollock working on the floor and is absolutely inspired by that. And what a painting can be, that a painting doesn't have to begin at an easel. And so you can see her in this picture working on the floor. One of the things that's really important that she develops and she makes it um, clear in one of the videos that uh, yes, she saw Pollock, but she took 
the work to new, a new place, which is absolutely, absolutely true. It has nothing to do with Pollock, except that she's working on the floor. She develops her technique of staining and um, uh, soaking, soaking the canvas. One, one thing that happened along the way is she looked at one canvas that she felt was a little too bright. Well, you can see how she's working here. So she flips it over and she sees the paint has gone all the way through to the other side. So she uses that side, but then she works on top of that side. So thus you've got both this combination of the staining that I mentioned earlier and the soaking. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, Carol Cohen had a question, I believe, or had her hand yeah, up. Something is, is making some noise. Yeah. Does anybody hear that? Yeah. I'm hearing it too. Could everybody mute? I didn't, I was wondering if we're getting some feedback. I don't think it's because Joanna has two screens going. I'm sure one of them is muted, but it sounds like a microphone. It, it's hard to tell what, what it is. It's like a feed, like a feedbacky sound. So yeah, if everyone can mute, I would, I was aware can of that. Can you hear me? Well. It's Laura Gerber. Yes, Laura. I mute for some reason. I can't hear Joanna either. So you're fine. You're I'm fine. Really low. I'm on the really low, but not totally on mute. Don't worry about it. We're good. I think it stopped actually. It's 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 it could be from yeah. Joanna's studio. When she's I hope talking. it's not from here. It's not it from here. Now. Okay. Let's yeah. get, let's get back. I hope everybody can hear. So we were talking, what, this is totally abstract and it's, beautifully about color. So, but nevertheless, there's a sense we don't, we always begin to see something. What do you see in this picture? What does it make you think of? Let's start with that. I see a butterfly. Okay, ah, now I see it. You're taking the white of the canvas in. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, anybody see something else? It's interesting. Vegetables. I see fruit mm -hmm. and vegetables. Or, or vegetables, like a lemon or a something. Okay. Or... Joanna, so, when you said um, it's interesting because it's about color, I remembered the story of Little Blue and Little Yellow I used to read to children. And it almost looks like the blue in the center is impregnating the yellow. <laughs> Or, or like, it's like a sperm entering a, a ovum. <laughs> and green is what you get when you mix the two. So that's kind of, but when you said that, that's the story I came up with. I don't know that I would have caught that, but the way that the blue is intruding into the yellow and. So another way of thinking of that is look at the dialogue between the big gold yellow and the blue and the green the middle green that's pushing right that's pushing into it it's almost like the two are holding up the blue mm. um and what she's doing with that because you can start you know i remember those stories sarah because you also worked with some kids and had right. them write their own right uh their own book look at how each shape is not only a different size but just the ones that are tight and the ones that are, are a little bit moved away, like the yellow at the, at the bottom right. And the shapes, you can't quite pinpoint what the shape is. It's not quite, it's, it's <clears throat> a, they're biomorphic shapes. They're not geometric, but then the edges are changed. There's sort of a certain amount of angularity in them. Uh, so there's a kind of tension in this area. Now keep looking for some surprises, any colors that you suddenly see that you didn't see before. Red. I, I red see that. Red that. That little tiny red. And the white here on the left side of the frame. Right, yeah, right there. White dot. Yeah. Anything else? The little yellow. dots in that, this looks like a pear actually. On the right, there's little dots. Yeah. Yeah. 
And just the tension, think about the tension that she creates, um, the, the sort of movement, there's pressure between the, when I mentioned the blue and the big gold shape and the green, uh, there's also almost a kind of squeezing of the shape that becomes what one of you saw as a butterfly uh, along the edge of the canvas where the blue the darker blue that's on the outside begins to flow in uh, into the piece and um, where it softens. All of that is so much part of this beautiful vocabulary. Let's get on to the next slide. Oh my God, I'm running late. Sorry, everybody. We started late too, though. Um, we did start late. So this piece, um, Again, another enormous piece, and this is really a good one to, to look at the, react, the relationship of the red to that blue-green around the outside. Just see how that changes and where it looks the brightest, where it gets to be the most intense. Where does it get to be the most intense? On the left side. Left side. That left, and part of it is it's getting into a blue or blue-green color. And if you put that color against red, um, there's a vibration that occurs, which has to do with just the way we see light. What pulls you away from that? Green, I think. Green. There's that green and then the space at the top um, that is, she leaves these little narrow spaces that become really important. Let's get on to the next slide. Another giant one. Now, this one, anybody have the urge to turn it? Yes. Yeah, it should like, it seems like the blue should be on top. I um, turn it. I don't. I feel like I see a profile. Yes. I felt my head, I see a profile. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like great. an open the only reason that that blue that notice how dark that blue is and that's really holding the weight at the bottom on the other hand because the other shapes are so big in a way I did I've got a a, a piece of this uh, I mean I did a print of it um, and I flipped it around and it just didn't work at all oh. uh, I thought that was interesting because first I had that impulse but look again at the areas, the little white at mm -hmm. the bottom and just these edges between color. When she talks about color flowing into line and line into color, you can really uh, see it in this painting. Let's take a look at the next one. This is a much, I think that the pinks and reds are a little bit more intense in, in the actual <laughs> What's different here? Thickness of the oil paint. So of that, it would be acrylic, but the thickness of the paint, and she talks in one of those um, slides about, well, all of a sudden these globs appeared. And uh, because she's letting the painting do the talking, and she said it was interesting, I think she said in the 80s, that the globs appeared. And that was a time that thick paint sort of came back into um, what everybody was looking at. Uh, <clears throat> how does the, the thick paint affect the space? It's like it's, I focus is on it because it's got the thick paint versus the flat part. You focus mostly on the thick paint. It feels like it's floating. Yeah, I think it so too. It feels almost like it's off of the surface. Now again, this painting is huge. Um, this one is for Covent Garden. And uh, it's, it's a, a big piece, but you get that sense of um, the space going way back, particularly because there's this paint that's, that's floating on top. And she's trying to balance all the thick paint with some of the details in the back. So it's a different kind of dialogue that she's working with here. Not just the color, but a little texture. Uh, let's go to the next also, one. I think this is the first line I've seen. 
you know, she has a shape that looks very linear. Mm -hmm. Yes, she has landscapes along the way, and we didn't actually talk about that, but let's look at the next slide. Wow. So this one is a little different, Mineral Kingdom. This was obviously in the 70s, it says it. Um, I think it appeared, I thought it appeared in one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the videos, but I'm not sure. So here you can just see the movement. The movement is really important of, of the paint and however she slashed it across the top, the, the surface of it. Um, and if you think of space and what comes forward and how deep the space is and how does that change? Is white closest to you? Is blue closest to you? Um, it'll keep, the planes will shift around. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Ooh, wow. So this one is around 1990. So this is one of her last ones. And anytime you have a horizontal that's going all the way across, it has a landscape feeling. Uh, it just does. And I know that there was a period um, when artists didn't want to have any landscape. That was when you didn't have images about anything, so you'd have to turn it around. Um, but it's not actually a picture of a landscape. Um, <clears throat> it just has a feeling about it. What's the biggest surprise for you in this painting? The, the location of the colors. I think it looks like it should be turned up, uh, yeah. flipped. Doesn't so the, feel like the, that, Carol. You know, that, that light yellow ought to be the sky and the other the, the ground. Actually, I think it looks like a beach and the yellow could be the sand and the, and the other part. Was, it could uh, be the sky. No, no. And the other part, except. The water, the water and the sand and it looks like people. Those little turquoise things look like people that could be at the edge of the water. And it, and it could be. The thing about the yellow in this one is it's that real thin paint. And mm -hmm. then she's got the thicker paint going across the top. Um, is there a different a difference in feeling in this one from some of the others? It doesn't feel, doesn't feel as light to me. I think the purple really makes it heavy. It feels heavier. The yeah, purple not, like pushes, the purple to me pushes everything down. It's, it also feels dark. Mm -hmm. yes. The darkness to it, a heaviness it does. But I love her unexpected dots. Oh, the blue, right here. I don't oh. think it does because I think. And the the light of it, the the yellow is so light. So bright. That, um, in a sense, it's just in a way the world kind of upside down there. Really you know, good. Right. Her black, okay. Her dot. She's got a black dot just just there. In the bottom left hand corner. Mm -hmm. I see that. And some of that could happen just by sp you know, spraying the paint and then saying, I'm going to leave this. Right. Because right. with yeah. this work, there is, it does come out of the abstract expressionist movement. It gets into something called color field painting, which in the future I'll talk about in, in some other program. But um, in it, the, the marks that have been there are left for you to see. So that has to do with the abstract expressionist. Let's see the next slide and I think we'll get into Barbara Caston's work. Yes. Okay, so Barbara Caston, I, um, I think Louise Nevelson was born, as I said, in 1899 and then um, Helen Frankenthaler, somewhere between 1924 and 1928, I don't remember exactly. And Barbara Caston is born in 1936. And she is from Chicago. She um, has a studio, I think, in the Bridgeport area <clears throat> in one of the big buildings. And I thought of visiting her. I don't know quite how to get in touch with her because her, she doesn't have a dealer in Chicago but she has really big dealers in New York and London and other parts of the world. She started off as a tex in textiles. She went to initially um, the University of Arizona and then to, and to got a um, master's degree at California, in the California College of Arts and Crafts. 
And she started off, as I said, in textiles. And then she began to create um, pieces like this, which are cyanotypes, which are not quite photographs, you put something down, you put an emulsion over it, it's exposed to light. Am I getting this right? Um, and so you can see that sense of textile, if you look closely at this image, you'll see the, um, that she created it possibly from screens. Let's get on to the next one. That doesn't work. So, so here, she's dealing with material still. And this is a really interesting piece. If you look at it dimensionally, uh, what do you see? What stands out? I see a square. OK. Rectangle. Or a rectangle. Yeah, a rectangle. Looking. A light rectangle. Half circle. It and looks like a it. half circle. But look and see if you can find a box from that square. Yeah, there, I saw the big box with the top. There we see a top mm -hmm. and a side. Yeah, so, right. There's a box, right? There is a box. Yeah. Three dimensional box. box. So yeah. now you're seeing the dimensions. Mm -hmm. And then, in a way, there are two boxes because one goes down and cuts off the lower left hand mm -hmm. corner. And the other is partly there because there's a red line and an indication of a, a shallower box. Um, but then she's pulling you in these, these different directions. Um, again, what, what directions are missing? Can I interrupt for a second? Somebody's got their audio on and there's a man in the background talking. Could you turn that off? If it's at your house, whoever's house it's at, turn off your audio, your microphone. I'm sorry, there's a man on a converse, phone conversation, it sounds like, and it's very disruptive. So, um, anyway, what direction is missing or what directions are missing? Vertical, horizontal. No verticals and, or horizontals. So that really creates the sense of instability. But she's using the different lines to, to pull you around. I want you to take a, you know, note that because we're going to see uh, more images in which she really loves, she loves these angles. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, now this is done in the 80s. And she did a few like this where now she's using a real photographic means. Um, I'm not 100% sure how she, how she did this one um, because later on we're going to see that she sets uh, pictures up. But it looks like she's combined because there's the statue in the, in the middle. Um, but now we've got geometry uh, that... I think of Louise Nevelson, nothing like her, but just that there is a sort of geometry here and intense color uh, that makes me think of Helen Frankenthaler. Where do you feel you are as a viewer? What kind of a place does this seem to be? In a modern house, we see the balconies. That's where I think I'm in a modern home. Okay, anybody have another idea? Yeah, look at apartment. that figure. An apartment building, perhaps. An apartment building. Art museum. An art museum. It definitely could be an art museum. Anything else? Uh, there's something, there's an antiquity there. Yeah. I see the woman, the way she's draped, the way she's drawn as someone from the past. So that gets sort of the uh, art museum idea. Um, and where are you as a viewer? Where are you looking? Are you looking up? Or are you looking down? I feel like I'm up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm up. looking at the woman who's looking to the up to I'm see what at she's looking at. The I feel like I'm, I'm looking down. down. I'm, I feel like so. I'm I think down. it depends where, because if you look at the upper left, you could yes. be looking down into the blue. Obviously, you're under the 
this balcony thing on the right, but then you're maybe across or looking down. And so she keeps you moving both with the angles and the images that you see. I feel like I'm on an escalator or maybe the character who's half dressed is on the escalator. Um, let's take a look at the next slide. So this is another one of her works from the same, the same period. And what's happening in this one that you didn't see in the last one? That's not a good question. Um, look at the shapes and see how she's making shapes. So what, how does she create a sense of shape? Reflected sort of shapes or shadows almost. Okay, shadows. Actually, it has a very surrealistic uh, feel to it, that picture. It could it be a Shopsner Valley. Absolutely, absolutely feels surrealistic. Um, is this a place? Where is it? All the colors are so hot. I mean, they're just like they're, everything's on fire. And yet, Anna, it, it looks like the painting you're standing in front of. <laughs> That's my painting. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that, that has hot color, too, and purple, which and is... The, and the squiggly, the squiggly the line. Sand. <laughs> the sand. I, I never would have thought of that, but um, one of the things, one of the things in this painting, um, piece in, in the photograph is look at the blurred edges. And the last one, we didn't see so much blurring, but here she has a sharp red triangle with a blue triangle and some kind of a ball in it. But then if you go up to the right and you look at the purple and the separation of the purple and the um, whatever on, on the right side, it just softens. So she's got this this kind of fluid, fluid uh, look to it. Um, and that gold, the gold shape that comes down with the outline adds that the sense of light is really important to her. Um, any place you feel that you could put your foot down and feel safe? Yeah. No. There's no, not, not really. It no, it's coming out. It's like a pinkish with, with it's like tubular on the left side on the bottom. It looks like it's holding up. Um, it almost looks like um, um, it's that orange um, inverted shape. And it looks like it's resting on that pink tubular thing on the bottom, very left. And that that tubular thing, I'm going to call just in the interest of time. Um, a floating device for the water, an inflatable, an inflatable raft. Um, let's take a look at the next slide. So now these are done, the two that we're going to see now were both done in the 2000s. So this is much more recent work. And I assume that you watched the video and you got a sense of um, the artist who grew up, she's the one who said she had a really nice childhood, uh, unlike the, the other two. Um, and she grew up in Bridgeport. Um, and she's, she's still working there. And there was a nun in her uh, education. Yeah, I hear that now. Too. Please, please mute your screen, everybody. There was a nun in her education who was really important to her. But this one is called Crown, Crown Hall. And, um, you know, maybe from um, IIT. Um, so the thing that's really interesting that I hope you got in the video is how she does some of these, where she's actually setting up pieces of color plexiglass and other objects and balancing them. I don't know how she got the, where the shadows came from. This feels like it's a window. So the how of these 
um, are, are really quite, um, quite mysterious. And these are all uh, photographs. Uh, look at- but They're photographs of sculpture. I mean, she literally creates this dynamic form and then photographs it. So there's exactly. two art happening simultaneously, which I found so fascinating. And like, they're how photographs- she the shapes. Um, but then they go beyond. I, so she's got the shape, but then, and then the shadows it creates. And that's why in the, the background, I have no idea where the organic, um, the organic shadows, it's amazing. Just the, the process, Marcia, I'm glad you <laughs> enjoyed that one because I, I really found it mysterious. Look at how it changes on the right. Um, as you go from the top to the bottom, what happens? Looks blurry. It looks blurry. It's almost like there's a reflection there, maybe a mirror. Uh, and so, well, not a mirror. A mirror would be sharper, but something that distorts the line that comes down um, at, at the bottom. And this one, we've been talking a lot today about the horizontals and verticals. This has verticals. I'm not sure. And it, we think horizontals, but I think they're probably all off a little bit. That helps keep these, these shapes moving. Let's take a look at the next slide. Um, and so this is another Crown Hall slide. And again, if you saw that video, that only gives you an inkling of an idea of how it's done because when I look at the complexity of this, I still don't, I, I still don't get it. Um, and what kind of, but we can look at this as any other um, painting. Again, these are very large uh, images. The, the way that she produces them. And um, what, what reads as the furthest back point? What's furthest from your vision? You mean color? It can be color. I feel like that light green looks like a V, like a triangle. And that triangle pulls you back, but then if you squint down. Purple with dots, that seems like sky or some like you're like, like at the very bottom on the right. The very bottom on the right? Mm -hmm. Or is that a floor? Yeah, it looks Are like you in a building like looking floor. out of a window? Or, well, or to me, that's the background part. I don't know. Um, because there are so many shifts that the reason I asked the question, what goes back was a little unfair, because if we could really look at this for a long time, anything that goes back pretty much will come forward, except maybe if you think of the upper left as a kind of window or window spaces, but she really keeps us uh, moving. Let's take a look at the next slide. Joanna, can, I'd like to ask a question. It's Gail. Gail, come yes. I'm getting a little bit confused with her art. I watched the movie and I saw that she does a lot of light with um, mirrors and angles with, ca with the camera. But the picture with the statue of the woman, was that done with a camera or was it painted? Okay. okay. Um, uh, Gail, did, did that was paint? done in the 80s. And she may have, I know that she doesn't use any digital, I mean, she doesn't use that to, to change her, her colors or anything. I can't answer that. The video is what she's doing now. So I suspect there's some collage element that she put into it, into the other one. But these all that are done in the 2000s um, don't have that. So let's look at it, I mean, Otherwise, I don't know. This is again dealing with her, the setup that she's using now. What feels solid? Does anything feel solid? Silver in the front, the silver. And okay. Like metal, but it's probably, pla I know it's probably plexiglass, but it looks like silver. So that part in the front, the, the one that's an angle at the bottom. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that could be a little bit more solid. Right above it is another parallelogram shape. If you look at the difference from the right to the left, see how it fuzzes out so that shape disappears. Um, some of them seem to appear and then, uh, and then not. Um, I do where I've really run over time, I guess, today. Joanna, so, um, I do just want to point out in this one uh, just the beautiful use of the dark and light and how yes. tiny she can make a little triangle at the bottom um, and how important each shape, whether it's a shadow or a piece of light, each shape is really um, so beautifully put together. So I'm going to stop this part now. I think um, that was our last slide. And um, just any questions, and I'd like to tell you about what's coming up for the next couple of weeks. Joanna? Yes. This is Dina. Hi, Dina. Hi. I, I just want to take you back to Louise Nevelson for two seconds. OK. Uh, she was the star attraction at the University of Chicago's Festival of the Arts in either 63 or 64. And I was her escort for the entire time she was in Chicago. Oh, uh, how wonderful. Well, it's almost wonderful because I really don't remember anything that she said. Oh but dear. She was she was in in those days she was so ordinary on campus. All of us were ridiculously dressed. <laughs> and, and she was just uh, just a delightful person to be with and she had um she does not call them and refuses to call them assistants, but she has what I would call muscles and had them in those as as early as the 60s because what she was dealing with and and she also is a terrible sleeper so she would go out in new york around two three four in the morning with her guys and pick up wood huh. and the guy the guys would uh, treat the wood and paint it and then she would put the sculptures together huh. so i want everybody to know that i know for a fact she's had help for a long long time well and she was just a charming charming person I met her at Richard Gray Gallery um, briefly when she had a show there, and yes, she was absolutely um, uh, charming. Around that time, I think, is when she was in the Venice Biennial, so she was certainly uh, well, really well known. Dina, thank you so much for, for telling us that. That's great. Um, any other questions or comments? And then I'll tell you a little bit about next week. <laughs> I I just wanted to make one comment about Helen Helen Frankenthaler. <clears throat> um, my ex-husband saw Bello, knew her well, and knew Clem Greenberg well too. <clears throat> and in his uh, gallant, generous moment, Saul would say about Frankenthaler. Every successful artist has behind, every successful woman artist has behind her a powerful man. <laughs> Referring to Clem Greenberg, of course. So, so uh, <clears throat> um, anyway. But, wow, that is really interesting, Alexandra. <laughs> Before I would agree with you. But, but I do have to say, um, Helen did meet the right folks, not only Clem Greenberg, but um, Pollock, well, through, <laughs> partly through him early on. I have an idea. She, she talked about, um, <clears throat> uh, with Charlie Rose on that one, she talked about being, in, when he said, who influenced you? And she ends up talking about being everything in her background and being in the right place in the right time and, and all of that. Connections, male or female, are probably true, but in a way, Saul was certainly right back then. I think for women, it was particularly, um, particularly difficult. Mm -hmm. But then we can think of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner 
um, and maybe Lee helped push Jackson along. So that that's a really interesting thought for a um, really, whole really topic really. of conversation. Um, next week, we are going to have um, a virtual meeting with Eleanor Spies Ferris, who is a wonderful uh, local artist who comes from an art family. Well, actually, um, she was married to an artist, her late husband, and uh, her two kids became artists. We're going to hear all about that and really look at, in depth at her work with her work. Um, uh, next week. She's delightful. She has a show at the Evanston Arts Center. Luckily, she had a really great opening uh, before the shutdown. So I think that's going to be a treat. The week after that, we're going to be um, <clears throat> looking at work by uh, three African-American artists. Uh, right now, there are a number of African-American artists who are really significant. I haven't selected the three yet but that I will be doing this week. And then another meeting will be uh, also a virtual meeting with two, um, with two other artists. Where we are not meeting the artists directly, um, I will be sending you more video information, I mean more videos, and I may send some anyway that I stumble over that are interesting. So I guess um, I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much for your Thanks, comments Joanna. and for joining today. Please feel free to send any emails to me if you have any comments or thoughts or suggestions or compliments um, or anything. Um, did you see I threw that in there for like a little, little helpful? <laughs> Anyway, um, anything. I'm here for you. We're here for you. We're so glad you joined today. Nice, nice attendance today. And we look forward to seeing you next week. It's going to be great. I've known Eleanor since I was very young and she's fantastic. And I've learned to really appreciate her art um, and the surrealism and the, the um, symbols that she uses. It's really fascinating. I, so bought her, I bought her work at our last auction. Oh, that's great. Yay, Marcia. Yeah. Thank you, Joanna. Good job today, Thank everybody. You. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Care. You let us know for next week? Yes. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Sarah will. Thank you. I'll be in contact with you. I'll get you the invite. Um, Usually when it's something that we know that there's somebody coming up with no sort of homework you need to do prior, you'll receive something the day before from me with just the invitation um, that you'll have the Zoom link to click. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Love Louise. Great. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.